Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar today is presented by Akita Box. Uh, we are doing this with video speakers today, so if you do not see us on the top of the screen or the side of your screen, please pull down the gray bar and uh, you should be able to see us all. Uh, thanks again for joining us. So when it comes to building capital budgets for your organization, how often is facilities at the bottom of at the top of the list of priorities if you answered never then you aren't alone facilities are expected expensive to maintain and they can often be lumped in with other cost line items that you need to approve seen through this lens it's easy to understand that why they have historically struggled to make it to the top of the strategic capital planning priority list so we're looking forward to a, a talk about that today because while capital planning for facilities typically is full of uncertainty outdated data and assumptions it doesn't have to be that way and getting this process right is especially critical now as buildings have sat vacant for a year and they begin to ramp up where the impacts of deferred maintenance and capital projects will start to be felt and we're sure that many of you in the audience are, are experiencing that as well so we're looking forward to some solutions today with our expert of panel panels that you see here uh, there will be a q a session toward the end of the presentation so please be sure to have your control panel uh, accessible you can type in your questions in that question box at any time during the presentation and our speakers will address them at the end. We look forward to that. Uh, also, if you are interested in a continuing education credit for the session, look out for an email from facility executive after this presentation. So first, uh, I would like to introduce the speakers that you see on your screen here. We have Juliana Beauvais. She is Research Manager of Enterprise Applications with IDC, a premier global provider of market intelligence, advisory service, and events for the information technology telecom and consumer technology markets. We're looking forward to hearing from her today. We also have Matt Mazuski. He is CEO of Akita Box. They are a leading facility management software and data collection provider dedicated to making data-driven building management easy. And then we also have Josh Lowe. He is co-founder of Akita Box. So thank you everyone for joining me uh, on the panel. And um, I'm going to give each of you uh, a moment to introduce yourselves a little further so the audience um, kind of gets your perspective on the industry and then, then we'll jump in. Um, so, Juliana, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Anne. Um, my name is Juliana Beauvais, and I am an um, industry analyst with IDC, and I cover software that companies use for um, enterprise asset management, facility management, and, and maintenance, including capital planning. Uh, before this, I was with uh, GE, uh, leading um, strategy and market research for their smart building and lighting division. And then prior to that, I was with the Boston Consulting Group, um, helping to create a new global research organization. Uh, so I have uh, deep knowledge in market research and technology um, that I'm bringing to the table today. Thank you. And Matt, welcome. Uh, thanks, Anne, and thanks, Julianne. It's great to have you on the call with, uh, with Josh and myself. Um, my experience with uh, capital management goes way back to my, my days of uh, working with uh, uh, for Governor Jim Doyle in the great state of uh, Wisconsin. We were uh, located right next to the capital planning team. I did learn how to ask for lots, uh, lots and lots of money and be relatively successful at it uh, as a result of being that close to those uh, executives and sort of carried it with me. Uh, after that, I, I ran Microsoft's global government business for a, a good many years, uh, Salesforce.com's. Uh, uh, global government business as well. And then uh, revisiting back to uh, sort of the capital planning side of things with a, a short stint at uh, Digital Realty Trust, which is the largest technology real estate investment trust uh, in the world uh, and got a, a ton of a great experience there. And then moved on to be able to uh, fund my exploration of, uh, of the startup world, which eventually leads me to the, the great Akita Box uh, that Josh uh, helped to co-found so that we can put um, the tools that uh, that everyone needs uh, from the boiler room all the way up to the boardroom uh, to be able to actually understand strategic capital planning and facilities management across the board. Thank you. And Josh? Yeah, thanks. Ha happy to be here and, and part of this conversation. Uh, my background's a, a little eclectic. I actually have an architecture and urban planning degree. Uh, however, really focused on technology, 3D modeling, AR, VR technologies <clears throat> over a decade ago and realized through my tech consulting with owners and operators of buildings that there was 
kind of this change happening underneath everything. The contractors started to bring technology to the job site and it ended up being unused once it got turned over to the owner and really felt that the industry was right for change and a paradigm shift um, and saw essentially the same problems being repeated over and over. And we all know the definition of doing the same thing and expecting different results and really thought that it was time to bring new technology and modernization to the facilities industry to take a completely different spin on the same problem to bring better results through technology and change. Well, good. Thank you. Thanks for that as well. So we're really looking forward to all of your uh, collective insights. And uh, of course, you out in the audience, please, of course, send your questions in so we can keep the conversation going toward the end. Uh, so we'll jump right in. We have uh, some questions that I'd like to pose to you and uh, welcome you know, each of you uh, to jump in as you, as you see fit. So the first uh, question you all see here on the screen, why is capital planning so timely? Um, specifically, I'd like to say, why is this facility capital planning, um, why is it such a timely topic for so many organizations uh, you know, right now? I meet myself and then I'll start. <laughs> um, so it's a it's been a longstanding issue, as I'm sure many people on the line know, uh, of trying to uh, decide what your capital plan should be and then um, making the case for them. It's been really aggravated, if you will, by the disruptions caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so even the best laid plans um, were just that plans and uh, probably did not get executed on, maybe not at all, or not as intended uh, in the past 12 months or so. And it's going to hit organizations hard when they get back, let's say, you, you know, particularly if you start ramping up to fuller occupancy in August, September, and you're running that HVAC system full time, uh, things are going to break that you didn't expect to break, that deferred maintenance is going to catch up with you. Um, so it's, it's good that we're having this conversation now because you as facility managers need to think, what can I do immediately and over time and in the long term to get my capital planning back on track? Uh, <clears throat> that's a great answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great answer, Juliana. One of the interesting things is whenever I've seen uh, large scale change happen in my career, it's it's created opportunities for organizations that historically have sort of not been in the driver's seat. And I think uh, I, I completely agree with Julian that that there are a ton of things coming up that are risky for folks if they don't make the right capital planning decisions and then they don't actually do the allocations the correct way. But it also this change gives a great opportunity for folks who've been suffering under continued and, and sort of revolving deferred maintenance that continues to build up to take advantage of the idea that people all of a sudden over the last year learned to do things extremely differently. We all learned to work from home. We all learned to let the dogs out without anyone seeing us do it. You'll see me do that a couple times behind me uh, during the webinar today. Uh, we've all learned to take care of our kids and educate them at home as well as at school. We've learned to adopt digital technology about three years ahead of everybody else's uh, estimations. And so that openness in terms of a mindset gives facility managers and portfolio managers and folks who manage capital budgets the ability to finally say, hey, you know that deferred maintenance problem that we had? It's really bad right now. And we've got an opportunity with people not yet returned to their daily work to be able to fully fund or at least partially fund or fund well in advance of what they traditionally have done to make sure that we return to work the way we want to. And the council is to make sure that everyone from facilities engineers to facilities managers to asset managers to portfolio managers all have the same information so they can talk about risk in an enlightened way and make the case finally that now is the time, even though we're, we're, we're okay making the switch to Zoom from time to time, we now should be okay in fully funding a deferred maintenance budget so that we can buy down that risk for all of the people that are out there. So I think it's a huge opportunity right now and capital budgets are a little more flush than operational budgets. So it may be the right opportunity for us to fully fund some of these programs. Thank you. 
Thank you. So I think we're going to see, there we go. Um, Josh, I think you had something to uh, share with us around these stats, is that correct? Yeah, and so, you know, really when we talk about the, the state and why it's important right now and kind of where we're at with facilities data, right, everybody says it's a priority, but I can't tell you one facilities group where I've walked into their office and said, hey, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable do you feel that your data is accurate? And I get like fives and sixes, sometimes twos and threes, right? And, and that's a problem. And we talk about why is it right now, facilities groups have been dealing with the idea of doing more with less for a really long time. And if you walk through our aging infrastructure and go in old boiler rooms, we're hitting kind of this critical mass of things are just going to stop working. And they're going to stop working in mass. And the idea that we've continued to kick the can down the road isn't really going to become an option anymore. Um, buildings are crumbling. They, they can't take it. And, and ultimately, we need to take advantage of the situation we're in now. One of the biggest impediments to collecting good data on your facilities is that they're occupied. We're in prime time to start getting ahead of the game. So as Matt talks about opening up and going back to work the way we want to, we need to be prepared for that and understand what that looks like if we're gonna have less people in a building because you know we're just not out and about as much. I mean, Matt talks about you know being comfortable being at home. My kids came home for a long weekend a year and a half ago now almost <laughs> and, and are still here and that's okay, right? But am I gonna go back to a physical office again? Probably not in the same way we did before, right? And, and so we just need to be prepared for that as a group of facilities professionals and start making the right moves. What's uh, what's interesting on this slide, and is <clears throat> look at the bottom part, right? The CFOs are not thinking the right way right now um, because their time horizon, weirdly, and I, I've got a lot of friends who are CFOs, so I need to be careful what I say, but their time horizon is shorter oftentimes than the facility time horizons that we deal with. We deal with assets that have 20 year life cycles and, and folks often have to think within the budget year that they find themselves in. The more we can arm regular folks and the more we can arm sort of middle management to be able to have those conversations with CFOs and drive home the connection to strategic outcomes the better off everyone is going to be. People don't necessarily understand that the fit, let's take the data center industry as an example. The physical plant and the way that that, go, that chews through energy has an impact on the strategic goals of every data center company on the planet. And yet they still fund it through their capital budgets and their CFOs are still very interested in controlling that spend instead of unleashing it and creating energy savings across the board. Some of our customers and the prospects we're talking to don't have that problem. And so, yeah, so it's just uh, it's a constant tension. So it's, it's important that we connect those folks up uh, to the strategic levers that they don't necessarily have right now. Yeah, and Matt, we're really seeing this tension between uh, executives saying, hey, we, we want our um, buildings and our assets to do more for us. Um, mm -hmm with uh, being flexible and hybrid and meeting all these new demands. Uh, and we want you to spend as little money as possible. You know, you're a line item that we want to minimize. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is how to overcome that. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to our next slide because I want, you talked about opportunity there um, in this situation that we've all been in over the past year or so, and also some of the challenges, um, you know, Matt, you just also touched on as well. So um, let's jump into the challenges a little bit. What are some of the challenges um, in you know, building on what we've just talked about that organizations are being faced with today um, when it comes to capital planning for their facilities? Uh, you know, you talked about the CFO's perspective versus um, facilities perspective, and um, you know, what else? What else are you seeing that we can um, tackle? I would say my <clears throat> my number one impediment is my dogs who wanted to go out and and, and bark at the world, and they'll probably do that again. 
I think overarchingly, every customer and prospect that we talk to talks to us about bad data. And the unfortunate part is as we get, as we arm folks with these strategic arguments to be able to go in and have great conversations about how they're driving an ESG ad agenda uh, for the board or how the facilities can support uh, capital retention or th how their facilities can support growth in and, in and of itself, that goes fantastic until they go and test the data and the data is really not as reliable as it could be. And so folks have to be really certain that the data is kept up to date in a real way. Does that mean deploying new technologies? We certainly think it means deploying new technologies. It probably also means deploying things that we don't do across the board yet, including sensors, including robots, uh, including drones in many cases to make sure that the data is kept up to date as much as physically possible. Because there's nothing worse than making a great strategic argument to your CFO and then find out that the data is at least two years old that you're relying on and she doesn't, she then doesn't push it forward because the data is simply not reliable. So I think the data is one of the big blockers that we've got. Thank you. Yeah. Julia, would you I think, just yeah, yeah. I mean, I think some of the other areas um, that we'll go deeper into today are um, the compliance um, and sustainability. Uh, issues. So uh, those are being driven by um, stakeholders, investors, uh, employees, clients, customers, as well as um, government regulations and company policy. Uh, so making sure that you are, uh, you know, tapping in to that and aligning with that as much as possible and see it as a, a positive, not as a, um, a barrier or just something you have to, to check the box on. Um, and then uh, I just carving out the time too, right? I mean, you're 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 so busy actually doing the job <laughs> on a daily basis that making sure you're setting aside time, uh, not just once a year, but ongoing uh, mm -hmm. to focus on the the bigger picture and the capital planning is going to help you with making that business case um, down the road. And the technologies and data that Matt's talking about lay the groundwork. I'm mute again. Uh, you hit on a great point there, though, right? The idea that they're busy doing their job. And what we don't realize is that because we underfund the facilities groups, they don't have time to plan because they're constantly putting out fires that are started by not funding the facilities groups. And so it's this never ending cycle of pain right that is brought on to those groups and, and guess what they get it done and they don't complain because typically that's the type of people that they are they're blue collar they take pride in what they do and, and that leads to the typical challenge of they also aren't used to having technology tools right they've always carried the tool belt with them and they just fix stuff and make it run and, and are taken for granted in that that landscape and i think the other thing we don't realize it, as kind of uh facilities uh group or, or culture is that the idea of the stuff that's being put into buildings now is crazy compared to even 25 years ago i mean imagine the fact that actually breathing fresh air makes people work better right like the problems that a facility solves for so the idea that you shouldn't be putting priority behind the capital spend and not just looking at it as a cost line, but a productivity line, uh, that's changing. And, and the C-suites and the executives need to understand the value that your facility and your facilities group actually bring to the bottom line. Okay, so then what's the ideal state for capital planning? How do you um, suggest uh, folks start to begin getting there? So that that's tough, right? And, and the the real answer is start getting better data, mm -hmm. right? Start start like just sitting there going, yeah, we really don't have good control of this, and, and we just spend when things break. Just changing and having a shift in attitude is a good place to start, right? Giving your facilities managers and, and folks on the ground tools to give you a feedback loop. I can't tell you how many times you go and talk to the technician and they're like, 
yeah, I fix this stupid thing three times a month and I keep telling people it's an issue and nobody listens to me, right? And nobody listens because the tools aren't in place to pass that information up to take action on what your boots on the ground are, are seeing. And everybody's like, well, our facilities people don't like technology. Okay, no, they they don't like being not being part of the conversation. They don't like not being consulted before you build a new building and you hand them a bunch of stuff that they know breaks all the time, right? And, and so engaging them in a meaningful way, not just in operations, but if you're a group that constantly buys or builds, how are you using the data that you have in existing facilities to make sure that you're not putting problematic assets that are gonna end up costing you more money over the life cycle? And that's one thing that I think the ideal state is, is that you're making decisions early, whether you're replacing a boiler or you're specking one out for new construction, you're using the data that says this one will cost you less money over time. We have to remember that only 12 to 15% of a building's true cost is spent during construction. And so a lot of times, right, they're being penny wise, dollar foolish, and not using that long-term data to their advantage. <clears throat> one of the things that we also, oftentimes I view uh, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, like Josh and I were on a call at, at six this morning talking to a, a potential client uh, on the on the East Coast as a translator for the capital. We had a capital. We had a, the capital planning department on the call, and what we were talking about was uh, the way in which uh, engineering facilities management groups speak their language to people who have no idea what they're talking about, and the people on finances side or capital management side who don't understand butkus about how a facility actually works and there needs to be something in between that actually tells people all right so here's what an fci is here's what that number means to you in terms of how well situated your facilities are but on the other axis we're going to put things that your board has told you your county board or your governor's office or your your school board or your board of directors have told you are important to you. Maybe energy consumption, maybe sustainability is the goal that you need to have. And so we're gonna tell you in your language, the facilities folks are gonna speak in the language of finance about what it is that they need to have accomplished. So the frustration of incessantly saying, this is gonna have a bad outcome is translated into terms that finance people can do something with. And interesting, Josh, Josh does focus on, I love that about you, Josh, focuses on cost an awful lot. I used to, at, at Digital Realty, I was involved with uh, transactions of actual facilities. And so what I focus on when I'm talking to a chief investment officer is the value, the NOI increases in that building when you take care of deferred maintenance. So if you're looking to trade a building and you want to get a low cap rate, the way for you to do that is fully fund your deferred maintenance that's that's on the boards and you will get more money when you sell that building than you would before doing it the right way. All right, thank you, Matt. So so then, um, Juliana, I'll, I'll put this question to you, I just kind of building on um, you know, this area that we're talking about. If capital planning is a known issue and we've talked about some of the, the benefits that obviously come about from proper uh, capital planning, so why is it still um, a struggle for so many organizations today in your view? Yeah, yeah, I think we, we've hit on them. It's the data, um, it's the organizational issues, uh, it's uh, addressing um, the needs of from the equipment and the technicians all the way up to the boards, uh, and then knowing which technology to deploy. And so those are some of the things we're going to talk about. So if we want to transition um, to the uh, first area, the, the connected data slide, please. And so We've talked a lot about data here, uh, and uh, there's many different kinds of data and a lot of things that you can do with it. Uh, so, you know, first I would say you've, you've got to create that baseline with uh, digitalizing your work orders, automating and capturing those performance metrics, you know, the, the mean time between failures, first time fix rates, all of that uh, should be captured in ideally a, a cloud base. 
system that uh, third party contractors, technicians, uh, admins, managers can all access uh, from desktop or mobile. So everybody's got that, that foundational data um, and you've, you've gotten, as, as Matt and Josh were saying, you're going from a, I feel like a five about my data to I feel like at least an eight, you know, about my data. Um, uh, because this is so important because it is only going to get worse. It's compounding. 37% um, of organizations told IDC that our physical workplaces will become increasingly instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. This is one of the top areas coming out of uh, COVID-19 is a permanent change. And what, when I see that, I, I say, oh man, that's, that's more data. So if you don't even have your uh, basic you know, work orders and workflows and equipment information in a digital form, uh, you're gonna be really overwhelmed uh, when you start getting additional kinds of data streams um, around occupancy and uh, the way people are using the buildings. And it's becoming, it's gonna to become top down. It's becoming a board level issue. We asked uh, IT purchase decision makers and, and line of business practitioners, what are the most important strategic areas for your board? And the second one was apply technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve decision making. So, you know, what does this mean for um, you? Uh, it means like, how can I apply, at least maybe with a, a pilot um, or a small scale to understand better anomalies in my operations? Uh, you know, which manufacturer's equipment is failing more often? Um, you know, which things are costing me more money to repair. And so it's, it's really taking that gut feel that the technician already has and applying um, some methodology to your data to uh, support that with evidence that you can bring um, to people and say, you know, we, we track this, we understand it, and these are our recommendations. This is what we do with it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you hit on a couple of good points there, especially with connected data and, and everything changing, right? I mean, things that we used to think were a good idea to do preventative maintenance on because it extended the life of the asset, we're finding actually doesn't extend the life of the asset. Uh, we're finding that the labor costs, right? So that's why connecting all of your information from work orders to, to IoT to understand that at some point your labor costs on certain items exceeds the cost of replacement. And so changing strategies based upon the real data is where we need to start driving to in order to make sure that every hour spent, every dollar spent is bringing ROI back to the organization and isn't just wasted because somebody told me it was a good idea to go check that pump that cost me $150 all in to replace, and I cost the company $75 to be out there two hours a month, right? That's where we need to start using the data and making sure that we're making those, not only data-driven decisions, but ROI-based decisions. I think, uh, I think, A, I think the first step should be for IDC to promote Juliana. Uh, I think that's clearly the first step in getting people to truly understand what's going on here. But, um, Interesting, we've got to look at the data that we even already rely on. And I'll keep people, I'll keep firms' names out of this, but oftentimes for replacement costs, we'll use industry averages and, and sort of regional averages and, and, uh, and sort of uh, uh, trademark averages and, and data that is, I would say, A, less than accurate just from, a, from an industry perspective but it's not your data and so you're drawing conclusions based upon averages based upon really um surveys that are out there and they're the best that we can do at least the best that we used to be able to do but if you're able to connect all of this data that you're collecting from whatever cmms that you have all of those work orders all of those failed inspections all of those methods of procedure that have been either passed or not passed and you are helping to augment that assumption of industry averages to get you to truly connected data so that, that you may have a particular manufacturer's air handling unit and it may last in general 10 or 15 years,
but this one has been on a preventive maintenance schedule that's fantastic and has had the attention that it needs and it's passed every one of its inspections and therefore you can put your capital reserves out by two years because you think that one's going to last longer and the same in the other i tend to be a positive person so i try not to use the the negative side of that which is hey you know this this uh this hot water heater you know has had 15 reactive work orders placed against it in the last six months i got news for you it's not going to last seven years and you probably should replace it right away but we treat data still in silos and so what we need to do is break down those silos and have work orders directly work with capital management so that we understand what's going on and work with the data feeds that we get external to those systems to augment them and give you a view of your data not just industry data mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. so Juliana, did you have an additional comment? Uh, no, I think let's let's move on um, to the sure. next slide. Sure. I, think it, I was going to say, great next step okay, so next step two, because uh, we're talking about five steps here, drive sustainable outcomes. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so, um, oh, I, was say, I think Matt set it up. I'm just going to hit it a little bit that, um, uh, <laughs> Every, more people care about that darn hot water heater now than ever before. <laughs> people that you might think have no business caring, but you know this is this is the world that we're in now, um, where uh, someone's going to ask, "Do you have a green hot water heater? Do we do we go with a tankless? Do we, you know, how old is it? How much energy is it using? Yeah. Right? Uh, and and why? Why are these things mattering to organizations now? Um, you know, you sat you sat in your office with your you know storeroom for years doing your thing, and now all of a sudden you've got all kinds of people up in your business, right? Well, uh, it's because the companies are having these really high level um, initiatives around sustainability, and they're looking for benefits beyond just you know what we're doing here in maintenance and facility management and, and capital planning. Uh, so people are looking for from their sustainability initiatives. How do I improve my green building ranking? Right, we have lead for years. Um, uh, how do I attract new customers and keep existing customers with my sustainability story? Uh, investors are huge with you know uh, pockets of money that are available uh, for people who meet certain investment criteria. Um, better able to attract top talent and new hires. Uh, you know, people care. Some some people care about the company they work for and what and what they're doing from a sustainability perspective. Um, so this is just to try to give some broader perspective as to why you might be dealing with some of these um, issues. And we have um, on the next slide, um, we'll get into a little more of some of the the compliance and the specific initiatives. I think on I on think the sustainability so. side, what what's interesting, I I teach my my leadership teams to have um, to have short memories, right? uh that it's a uh, sales oftentimes is a very difficult thing and if you remember the last one that you lost you're never going to get over it and you'll never move forward um same thing here right facilities groups have been sort of on the bottom of the heap for so long that when even when something obvious comes up they're like no, i'm not doing that again like the last time we made a proposal on sustainability we got shot down five times from sunday I've not seen a time in uh, in recent history where public pressure and the investment community, boards of directors and regulators and the nonprofit world, right? So Greenpeace and, and, and energy consumers have got an interesting relationship. Everyone seems to be pushing towards similarly situated goals. So if we can convince the, the facilities folks who have been sort of beaten down and beaten into submission for so long, to have short memories and to come back and say the opportunities in front of us to use i try not to use sports metaphors but it's like a running back who finally sees that gap open up and they have to hit it when it's open it's open right now and so i would challenge everyone that's inside of a facilities group that has got a sustainability set of goals that they're hearing about take that as the opportunity to hit the gap and do something special yeah you know, again, Josh, I think you're on mute. Barking, so I keep muting. Um, you know, to add on to that, I, I think it's a little bit of we're also seeing all that, right? So not only does it make sense financially, right? We can show savings across the board. I, I think it's more about you know resiliency, right? We need to take the look at sustainability and add the word resiliency to it. And nothing was more apparent to that 
than the disaster we saw in Texas with the blackouts and the winter storm, right? I live in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin on a farm. I have a generator that powers my house. Guess what? When I realized how much energy my light bulb sucked, I quickly switched to LED because now my generator could power my whole house as opposed to powering one room's light bulbs. And, and so everybody needs to think about this. There's lots of different factors coming into play, but it's not just energy savings. It's also the resiliency and making sure that we can give our aging infrastructure and grid a, a break where we can in order to move into the future on the right foot. Yeah, All right. I think that's a great transition. And if you want to take us to next. Sure, yes. Yeah. So we have connect the data, drive sustainable solutions. And our step three to greater capital planning is to focus on compliance. So let's talk about that a little bit, um, building off the need to drive sustainability. Um, how does compliance play a role in that, Juliana? Yeah. So we, the last slide, we're talking about how there's kind of a grassroots effort or some other factors that are driving um, that, you know, sustainability. Um, here we're seeing uh, that there are also going to be compliance issues, whether they're with uh, government regulations or company policy, that are going to have a profound impact on organizations. Uh, and if you can tap into these, uh, as Matt was saying, these larger uh, ESG initiatives and align what you're doing. So show when I put forth this capital plan it, and I am making these specific recommendations, it is uh, this thing is going to further our carbon reduction or it's going to help with our switch from fossil fuel or it relates to the circular economy or I can link this to a financial indicator. And, and that's going to really get the attention um, of the people who have to sign off on it and, and make those final decisions. Um, so that's it's really, really critical, I think. And uh, you might also find pockets of money tied mm -hmm. to these new ESG, ESG initiatives that you could um, get to help with some of this, um, getting through some of this deferred maintenance because you've now demonstrated that it directly relates to things that matter to high level decision makers right now. Yeah, that's a good point, Juliana. We, we talk on our leadership team all the time about the critical needs that are inside some of our customers and the critical needs that are inside some of the folks who aren't yet customers, but will be, uh, will be soon. And you know, nothing speaks critical need like regulation or at least regulatory saber rattling. If there's, if there's not regulation, it's on, it's on the horizon. And so you've got a choice. You can either wait for it to come and, and pay the increased rate to get it done, or you can get it done now at a discounted rate and be ahead of the curve and be able to use that to market your services, sell at a higher price point and be more successful as an organization. And the more people start to view compliance that way, the better off we're going to be. I think everyone views it as sort of a negative, hey, we've got to do this again, the government's making us do that, or the board is making us do these things from an ESG perspective. Instead, take it as an opportunity, right? You've got an opportunity, the organization has got a critical need, that means that funding will be easier to come by than the uphill slog that facilities groups have always had to try to get money to fix the things that need fixing. Well, thank you for that. So, uh, and I see here on the slide, uh, many, most or all of the items are around um, very important things that we're talking about, environmental uh, and energy compliance, things like that. So um, I wanna ask you, how has the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this focus on compliance? Uh, what have you seen, um, you know, whether it's some of the items that we see here on the slide or, or otherwise? So the uh, other compliance area that depending on your industry, may or may not have been um, strongly on your radar before, is health and safety. And now it has a, a new meaning beyond kind of your traditional EHS, um, you know, slip and fall, OSHA, uh, environmental factors. Um, uh, it now reaches well into um, common objects that people are touching, air circulation, uh, how close in proximity people are to each other. And some of these things are going to stay. They're going to be with us um, for a while, you know, post-vaccine or post-pandemic, um, because it just makes sense to keep uh, the workforce, the customers healthier. And we expect to see, we're already seeing um, some of it, uh, like healthy building accreditations and programs, um, you know, similar to what we've had on the uh, energy side. Um, so again, the more that you can think about that now, 
and get out in front of that, um, you know, the, the better poised you'll be um, to jump on the those things. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We're going to see the 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 lead lead um, that folks had on the on the energy side. Uh, when, whenever you see uh, Jennifer Lopez and uh, and Lady Gaga get on a commercial and talk about uh, clean buildings, you know that there's something coming uh, down down the road, and you should take it as an opportunity uh, to get out in front of it, like. When ultimately inside the world of places like commercial real estate, I know when I was at Digital Realty Trust, you know, we didn't view lead as a, as an option. Lead was a starting point for us. We had to be lead certified, and it was a question of what level we would be certified in any particular place. That's what's going to happen going forward. When we when COVID nineteen first hit last uh, last year, um, we reacted by giving away an awful lot of things that that uh, our healthcare clients needed uh, respirator tracking um, ventilator tracking being able to resize your rooms to maximize covid beds we gave that stuff away but we also challenged um, the leadership team to think about uh, what would these people need long term as a result of this we didn't think this would we didn't know how long it would last but we didn't think it would be temporary there were going to be some permanent things that came out of that and I still think we're, we're getting closer to understand that, but we're not quite there yet. But again, it's another great opportunity. Uh, funding those things gives you the ability to hit your strategic goals, as well as your health and safety goals. I'm glad Juliana brought that up. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to uh, step four in this journey to better capital planning. And we've talked a, a lot so far about data, which of course is very important in, in decision-making. Um, but what about other areas that our viewers can focus on to improve? strategic capital planning as we think, move through this process. Yeah, and Josh, I think you have some um, good thoughts on this. I just kind of put together a nice little graphic for you. Uh, but you know, you've got, you've got to connect all the way from the people uh, on site, at the equipment, in the field, uh, who have that real knowledge about uh, you know, what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis through the layers of management uh, into finance and then up into uh, making that story for the executives and the boards. Oops, my dogs were barking again. Um, and, and I'll learn one of these times to do it right away. Uh, you know, it, it's about connecting, you know, we talk about connected data. I think connecting teams is as important, but we can't start to connect those teams till we're connecting data, right? And, and solving for problems, and we pride ourselves on, you know, building solutions that aren't solving today's problems. They are, but we're looking at what problems are coming that we don't know are coming yet and making sure the data is flexible enough to meet those challenges and be able to pro provide insights. And I can give you an example, um, specifically with our healthcare clients, <clears throat> and, and you know, you can see the natural transition over time, but even more so now, like if I went into some of, and I used to do specifically healthcare construction, you went into some of those older aging hospitals, and man, I swear, if you sent me into one of those places, I'd probably get sicker just from being in that environment of white, sterile, you know, you just didn't feel like it was a place you could recover. And, and now moving to facilities that are designed like Hilton's, um, you know, our our youngest son, I mean, the last time we were in, in for that, I mean, you felt like you were in a maybe not five star, but at least four star hotel room with the amenities and the food was better, right? Like they're they're providing good things. And that all starts with synchronizing teams and understanding the impact that each team has on the other. And ultimately for the C-suite and the people who care about the bottom line adds to profitability. Right, and they all of a sudden understand that with choices in healthcare, if I have a choice of where I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the place that makes me feel like I can recover and get better, not the place that I feel like you sent me to die, right? And, and so I think that that synchronization of teams helps the facilities people, right? Because again, these are people who are prideful and love what they do and do it because they want people to have a clean, good place to come every day. <clears throat> Think about the joy and the pride, extra pride you're gonna bring to their job if they know that 
by responding a little bit quicker or by doing something a little bit better, they're helping somebody recover, which is bringing more patients in and ultimately making the business that they work for more profitable. That's really important as we move into the future uh, of cultivating data and teams. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so let's move to, to five and then we'll take some questions uh, as we, as we uh, you know, get toward the end of the hour here. So step five, deploy technology deliberately. Um, so what is meant by that? Yeah. So I deliberately put deliberately in there uh, uh, for, for a reason. Um, so it's not about deploying tech for tech's sake. But on the flip side, I hear from a lot of people in this industry that I speak to on an ongoing basis uh, that it's all bells and whistles or marketing gimmicks. And there's some skepticism um, over these buzzwords uh, and, the, and the real value of this technology. So, so my kind of um, remit to you is to say that let's just not dismiss it um, and let's look at uh, my particular organization and situation and how it can help me. So that's what I mean by deliberate is um, you're not doing it just because it's there and you think you should, um, but you're not ignoring it just because you're skeptical. You are uh, assessing where are the areas um, that my organization struggles with the most? What are the things we do uh, most frequently? Where are the things where we feel like we're still spending more time than we need to? Um, where do we feel like we could be getting better insights that we're, but we're not? You know, uh, where are our workflows still have manual processes? You know, sit down and, and, and have those conversations uh, and you'll pretty apparently, pretty readily start seeing these are areas um, where technology might might help us. And on this slide, I just have some um, data from a, a survey we did last year uh, that looked at uh, uh, what are our companies already using for enterprise asset management and what did they plan to use. Um, and so uh, some of these might be like, I don't think 27% of companies have like a, you know, a large scale drone program, but maybe they're using um, a, a couple of drones uh, for one use case or on one site um, where they, uh, instead of going out and doing the inspection once a year, they're able to do it more frequently and expensively. And that data is critical um, to infrastructure status uh, and those capital plans. Uh, <clears throat> so got to, got to chime in again with sort of promote Juliana. Uh, she, She's she's dead on in terms of the use of the word deliberately is hugely important. Um, even even boards like when we seek funding, if we seek funding and we come with buzzwords, we don't get it right. They're like, there's you know everyone saying that doesn't mean anything. I don't know what you're doing. But we talk about it. We always ask, what's the purpose behind? We've got a great innovation lead in Gladys Singh, formerly from Booz Allen Hamilton, who who has incredible ideas about all of this stuff, and she always digs sort of one level deeper. So we deploy drones, we do it on a, on a regular basis. But to give you an example, in our work with the United States Air Force, we did it to keep airmen safe, as opposed to going on roofs to figure out whether the facility was in a good condition or not. We're able to do that with drones and make sure that those individual uh, warfighters are kept safe and able to focus on things that are a little more critical than making sure that the roof is uh, in operating condition when we can do that in a much safer way for the engineers. In terms of uh, robotics, we've dealt with the seven, what I call the seven year FCA cycle, right? It's seven years, five years, however uh, infrequently facility condition assessments are done, the data is always a little too old and that can be solved almost immediately. I won't use the robot's name, but there's a, a number of robotic things out there that would allow you to take in essence, the same 360 degree picture every day from exactly the same spot and automate through AI and ML uh, the actual condition of those assets and the degradation and how fast it's happening. And we don't need to take up individual facility engineers time to do that. And then the, the last piece is sort of on IoT. IoT has been out for a long time, but now it's being deployed towards end goals. And when we talk about the idea to have a more full automation in what we do at a, at a key to box, it is purposefully to make sure that those facilities managers and engineers can do the great and strategic work that they've always wanted to be doing. 
to be able to work on the, the vitally important things as opposed to simply taking note that, yeah, that rust looks worse today than it did last week. Um, we can have machines do that work. And when we do that and we tie it back to specific things that are gains for the CFO and the CEO and the board of directors, that's the magical combination. So this is a great slide too. Yeah, and to add on that digital twin, right, you know, watching that grow, and I take full responsibility, right? I was part I was part of the, I think what turned into fear mongering, even though it wasn't intended that way, of being afraid of digital twins, because we were out there showing the future of what it could be, right? It's fully designed 3D models that are clash coordinated before construction, so that everything goes in and is installed seamlessly. And not only is it installed seamlessly, but we talk to the facility manager ahead of time to know how much access they need to get to certain things that they need to fix so that that's available. And then, hey, we're gonna give you augmented reality, uh, you know, Google Glass, whatever it might be, right? HaloLens in the field, and you're gonna be able to see through walls. And all that people saw, and, and trust me, this is all attainable, right? However, like one of my favorite quotes, right, is the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. Like this falls right into that in terms of, I don't want people to see the term digital twin and think of that unattainable thing for them. Digital twins are a spectrum. There is a starting point and at every step of the way, there is value to be gained, but if you're a facility manager sitting with an existing infrastructure, mapping every single pipe that's hidden behind the wall to get to that unattainable thing, nobody could afford, right? You may as well tear the building down and build it back brand new to do that. And so having people understand that there are steps that can be made, however, new construction, Start thinking about what you're asking for and how it's going to be turned over. And are you using a system today that can handle ingesting that type of data? And if you're not using a system that can ingest that type of data, it may be time to start looking for new solutions so that you can move into the future, right, on solid footing and knowing where you're going from where you've been. All right, thank you. Um... Well, thank you everyone for that. That is great. We have the five steps there. Um, and I think we've covered a lot of ground and we do have time for uh, several questions. I do want to let everyone in the audience know if you have questions, first of all, we have uh, Juliana, Matt and Josh's contact information up here, but also uh, any of your questions can be answered offline directly if we don't get to them. So please continue to send them in um, if you do have some questions. So uh, I'll jump right in for a few. Um, so I'm gonna work a little backwards from step four. We had talked about synchronizing the facilities team. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the human aspect of it for a moment. Um, in, in your view, who should be leading the facility capital planning process? Uh, is it facility leadership? Is it finance? Um, what are you seeing um, kind of as effective uh, with the organizations you've worked with? What have you seen happening even? Yeah, I can start with that one real quick and kick us off. I mean, the the best examples that I see are when they're starting to make those synchronistic teams, right? And you're connecting teams because ultimately the best capital plans that can be followed through are when the C-suite is on the same page as far as metrics that they're tracking to make financial decisions. So whether it be risk, whether it be you know condition, whatever those metrics are, having an agreement from a high level on what the core metrics they're tracking are and what the impact of doing nothing is on their core business, that's when you have the best decisions made and that's when it, it truly works, right? We, you know, we talk about from the boiler room to the boardroom, that's when it truly works best is when they're all talking about the same metrics. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll jump to another question, which uh, goes to, to data. And uh, someone had asked, where can we get data on life cycle cost or the remaining life cycle cost of existing infrastructure? Um, so, but where can we get that data? I, I'm guessing that means um, you know, how to start pulling I, that I was gonna, 
I was going to say we we have we have one answer that you can call us up and sign up for Akita Box and and uh, the capital management uh, application that we launched last year uh, has got not just it's important not just that data we've got really great data partnership with Gordian and RS Means and we get good data feeds directly from that uh, but we also have the ability uh, to take that data and clarify it a little bit again with with the work order history that happens in your environment, with the inspections history that happens in your environment. And we give you a view of sort of both of those realities. This is sort of where the industry number is, and this is where the real number is for you in terms of life cycle, and then in terms of replacement cost. And then I would say do the same thing on the FCA side. I mean, people need to, people are very used to doing FCAs in uh, paper-based, still a, a very paper-based or PDF-based, but it's really a paper-based uh set of systems i would take that walk back to make sure that you truly understand the data in your fca as well and how that connects to uh, industry oriented construction costing data and job data as well and that you don't just take one source like with everything else we've noticed that you bring in one source you augment it with the reality that you see and then you come out with an understanding and that's what i would suggest whether it's with the kita box or it's with somebody else yeah, and I would say the um, power of your peers uh, as well. So uh, make sure that you're in at least one um, kind of user group or uh, industry uh, association, and you know you're attending a, a virtual event now or a real life event, uh, and engaging in those conversations um, with your peers as well, because they have a a ton of of knowledge that they'd be able to share on how the methodologies they use and the sources of their data. And uh, and and read facility executive uh, uh, publications, uh, but ser but seriously, we often get uh, great great data from the articles that are written. You'd be surprised at what you can get through the great uh, reporting and coverage that happens in in, in FE uh, and and elsewhere. Just that you've got you've we've actually got a wealth of places to go uh, to get information. Official data sources, like I said, Gordian, RS Means, and things like that. But also the less uh, I, I like Juliana's idea about, you know, the circles that you run in are going to get you real information. And so, you know, go to your IFMA events, be part of your IFMA local chapter, be part of uh, the events that are sponsored by, by a facility executive. Take part in these kind of webinars so that you understand what the real data is that's out there. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have um, we do have time for one last question. I'll squeeze it in um, if someone wants to jump in on this. Uh, so. Back, how does deferred maintenance affect capital budgeting? So, um, you know, we talked a lot about obviously the realities out there that many in the audience are facing, I'm sure. So I uh, just want you want to jump in. How does deferred maintenance affect capital budgeting? Uh, uh, it, it makes prioritization hard. If you have, uh, you know, $5 million deferred maintenance problem um, and you're running a $2 million budget a year, that's hard to catch up with. And so it absolutely has impacts that you're going to need to deal with sooner than later. Now you can continue to kick the can down the road, but that's where the data-driven process works really well because you can take some of that deferred maintenance and realize that based on industry standards, this should have been replaced 10 years ago. Guess what? They maintained it well. They oiled it every day. They did stuff like that. I always tell people I have a Victory Ford tractor sitting out from the 40s, you know, in my garage, and it runs like it did the day it was built on the factory. And that's not a high risk, right? Where some of your other deferred maintenance might be a high risk. So dealing with it from the data side really helps you kind of get over that hump, but it's always going to be a problem until you deal with it. I've been uh, involved in a lot of change programs in my life, political and, and non-political. And the only way to take on large systemic challenges is to make progress each and each and every day. And the way and the way not to do that is to have your head in, in the sand. We, Josh and I will keep names out of this, but Josh and I uh, unsuccessfully pitched a large university system that had an 800, $800 million dollar deferred maintenance backlog uh, and they kick the can down the road and sure enough this year they have a 1.2 billion dollar uh, uh, deferred maintenance backlog it doesn't get better by sticking your head in the sand the only way that you can solve the problems both in society as well as in your facilities is to have your eyes wide open deal with some harsh realities 
bite the bullet and every day uh, an old friend of mine uh, gave me advice a long time ago uh, that that if you make progress each and every day even if it's small progress eventually you'll start moving that mountain yes agreed and that one last tidbit would just be um beware of the sunk cost mm -hmm. uh problem that we all face you know uh just because you spent some money on something doesn't mean that you should keep spending money on something um so try and separate um those decisions about what you have spent in the past to get to where you are with what uh, makes sense with uh, allocating your limited resources moving forward all right thank you well that will close it out thank you so much everyone juliana matt and josh really appreciate your time today I and mean, your thoughts thank you thank you Thank you, Akita Box, for sponsoring this webinar, and of course, to our audience for attending and for your attention. Um, please take a, a look out in your email box uh, shortly for a email from Akita Box, and we'll have a recording of today's talk if you'd like to review it, um, along with uh, their ebook, which is the future of capital planning. It'll be a great resource uh, to kind of supplement what you've heard here and you know dig a little deeper, dive a little further towards some solutions. So please look out for that uh, from Akita Box. Also, a recording of this webinar will be made available on our magazine's website uh, in the near future, and that's facilityexecutive.com. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.